on the air. The Return of the Atom. Now, this is actually a page out of uh, John Dalton's textbook on uh, atoms. But first of all, this is, uh, this is from a poem by a guy named Lucretius on, uh, on the nature of things, 50 AD. And his poem, it's, it's, I say it's a poem, it's kind of like an epic poem, you know, it's like a whole, like a book length poem. And in it, he basically gives us most of the information we know about the teachings of Democritus. If you remember from the first video, Democritus was one of the first ones to talk about everything being made of these little particles called atoms. And this is just kind of an example of this kind of thinking from, of course, much later. Democritus was about 450 uh, BC or something like that. And raiment hung by surf beat shore grows moist, the same spread out before the sun will dry. Yet no one saw how sank the moisture in, nor how by heat off driven. Thus we know that moisture is dispersed about in bits too small for eyes to see. Now one of the interesting things about this is that he's talking about atoms here, that the moisture is made of atoms, bits too small for eyes to see. But to me, one of the interesting things is we often think about these ancient philosophers or whatever as basing their stuff like totally on speculation and there's no, we think like they never used evidence, for example. But here you can see him using evidence, right? He's relating his hypothesis to observations. He's testing it against the real world in a sense. Do, does the atomic hypothesis fit the real world? And in this case, he's saying, yes, it does. How come when you hang clothes to dry at the shore, they actually get moist, right? And how come clothes dry again in dry weather or in a dry environment? What's, what's happening? What's happening to the water? And in this case, the atomic hypothesis ex was able to explain that. And by 1797, so we've jumped ahead quite a bit here from our last, um, well, not too much. 1770s was Lavoisier. He was in 1770s. Which, by the way, I didn't bring this out in that last one, but it's kind of interesting. Well, it's not kind of. It's extremely interesting how active the late 1700s were intellectually. 1776, right, was what happened then? A lot was going on in this part of the world, right? We had the Declaration of Independence. Now, it turns out a lot of the ideas in the Declaration of Independence were based on the ideas of John Locke, who was a philosopher over in Scotland or Great Britain. I'm not sure. I think it was Scotland. And uh, there were a lot of philosophers at around the same time coming up with a lot of really new ideas. In fact, they called that time period the Scottish Enlightenment. And this is, you know, a lot of science was done back then, too. So by 1797, the quantitative and scientific nature of chemistry was firmly established, being exemplified in Joseph Proust's Law of Constant Proportions. And here's how he stated it. We must recognize an invisible hand which holds the balance in the formation of compounds. A compound is a substance to which nature assigns fixed ratios. It is, in short, a being which nature never creates other than balance in hand. Pandure Edmund Sir, I don't know how to pronounce that. Weight and measure. What he's saying here is that compounds always have the same proportions of elements in them, same percentages. So like sodium chloride is always the same percent sodium and chlorine. Iron oxide is always the same percent iron and oxygen, and so on. The law of constant proportions. In fact, some of you read the definition of compounds in your book, and I think it mentions this in the definition of compounds, that it always it has a constant ratio of elements. And maybe he was referring to Newton's saying, numero pandere et mensura. Where's my Latin people pronounce this for me? This is a dead language anyway, right? God created everything by number, weight, and measure. So weight and measure, right? Pandere et mensura, I think is what it means. But Proust's idea was vigorously opposed by another chemist. Now, as we go through the history of science, you start to pick up on this pattern of kind of new theory opposition, right? Last time it was Lavoisier and the opposition was Joseph Priestley. 
course, there's others too. I, we, we tend to pick out particular scientists. It's, it's rarely just one scientist involved on either side of the debate. But in this case, uh, Berthelet was kind of one of the more outspoken ones, and he was also a very prominent chemist at the time. He argued that some compounds, such as certain oxides of metals, could have various proportions of oxygen and metal. So he actually had data. He wasn't just throwing this out there like he was some stubborn old crotchety guy. He was, he had evidence. He had data from various compounds. I think copper carbonate was one of them. And he would test it and he'd say, look, it's not always the same proportions. Depends where I get it. Depends how I make it. And so forth. What's that? Yep. I'm going to put this up too, so I mean you can. Well, you don't want to watch it again, so yeah. We're getting there. We're getting there. Right now, we just have a debate, right? Um, Berthelet's ideas were kind of the more common at the time. Proust's ideas were new. The idea that they would be definite proportions. And why is that? See, the primary impasse here in their controversy was that Berthelet and many other chemists did not distinguish between solutions and compounds. Now, last time we talked about the classification of matter, we did not emphasize the subdivision of mixtures. Mixtures can be subdivided into homogeneous and heterogeneous mixtures, right? Homogeneous mixtures are solutions. It's another word for solutions. And they didn't recognize any difference between compounds and solutions. Chemists of the day believed that atoms, whether in pure elements or in compounds, were held together by forces of affinity. They used this word affinity, which basically just meant some kind of attraction that we don't really understand. Atoms are held together by some sort of attraction. Metals dissolved in acid, or L, I shouldn't say atoms, not everybody believed in atoms at the time. Uh, metals dissolved in acid due to the affinity of the metal for the acid, and salt dissolved in water due to similar forces. So they kind of, now think, it's kind of hard because we all think in terms of atoms because that's a word taught from a young age, right? These people didn't have the concept of atoms. At least a lot of them didn't. They certainly weren't relying on it in interpreting chemistry. So they're just thinking of elements, and who knows how they're thinking about it. Some of them did believe in atoms, but they weren't. You know, the people who believed in atoms, like Newton and Boyle, they were more, um, well, Boyle was a chemist, but Newton was a physicist. So he wasn't, even though he thought about atoms or corpuscles, they called them, he wasn't really applying it to chemistry. So picture something dissolving in water, it's because it's getting drawn to it. There's an affinity of the salt for the water so that it combines with it. For Berthelet and many chemists of the time, salt water was a compound. Since salt water can obviously have man any different proportions of salt and water, that's supposed to say many, Proust's law must not be true. So think about this for a minute. If solutions are compounds, then it follows that compounds do not have definite or constant proportions of their elements. Because I can put a lot of different amounts of salt into the same amount of water and dissolve it. Okay? So that's where they were coming from. It's obvious salt water can vary in saltiness. So therefore, the proportions can change. All right? So you can see how this wasn't a simple thing to get over for these guys. Because the two researchers and many others were looking at the world through different glasses, they could never come to an agreement. All right? As long as people thought about solutions as compounds, they would not accept Proust's definite proportions hypothesis. So there needed to be another paradigm shift, which I mentioned last time in the case of, of Lavoisier. Along comes John Dalton. Though Proust won over many chemists to his position, it was not until the advent of John Dalton and his new atomic theory that Berthelet's views were finally abandoned, though not by Berthelet. Berthelet never, he went to his grave holding to his views. 
by the way, you know, he had all this data, but here was, here's the problem. It turned out his copper carbonate samples were not pure. And so that's why he was getting different proportions. But there's, uh, there's, there's John Dalton. Now, he's, he's an interesting guy. He was actually trained as a meteorologist, not as a chemist. And he was interested in the behavior of gases and their absorption in water. Now, I think I mentioned this in the last one. A lot of times, scientific revolutions are kind of brought about by newcomers to the field, young people and other sorts of newcomer, newcomers that aren't kind of entrenched. They're not in a rut of thought. So John Dalton was like this. He's coming in um, as a meteorologist. His experience had shown that gases that were dissolved in water could be released simply by shaking the solution. Did you ever experience that? Gases dissolved in water released by shaking the solution? Yeah, soda. Shake up a can of soda, open it, what happens? Where did all that gas come from? It was dissolved in the water. Now here's the thing, shaking is not a chemical process. It's a physical process. And if you did any reading in that chapter about mixtures, right? Mixtures can be separated by physical processes. So here you have evidence that a solution is a mixture. You follow me? So he was making these connections, by the way, nobody had made before because he's looking at it from the perspective of a meteorologist. He's thinking about gases and about water. And so because these other guys were just focusing on these solid compounds and maybe comp solids dissolved in water, they never picked up on it. <clears throat> the fact that a simple mechanical operation could separate the gas from the water indicated to him that solutions were not chemical compounds at all. Which, you can see, opens the door for Proust's law of constant proportions to be true. Now, Dalton was puzzled, though, uh, by something. He was puzzled by the homogeneity of air. Now, homogeneity means that you can't see any different parts of it. So, like, if I look at um, a piece of shiny chrome, it looks homogeneous, okay? Or a piece of steel. Steel is actually an alloy. It's a mixture of iron and carbon. But if I look at it, I can't see the carbon in it. You couldn't see the carbon in that aluminum foil when you were using it the other day. It's a homogeneous mixture. You can't see the nitrogen, the oxygen, in the air. It's homogeneous. If you dissolve salt in water, you can't see the salt. That's homogeneous. So he was puzzled by the homogeneity of air and the homogeneity of solutions of gas and water. This could be easily explained by affinity theory if solutions were compounds, but it proved difficult for Dalton. Why didn't the heavier gas settle to the bottom of the mixture? Why doesn't all the oxygen settle to the bottom of this room? And we'd all have to lay on the floor to keep from suffocating. He turned to chemistry, thinking he could solve the problems if he could figure out the relative masses of the elements. Right? So he was coming from totally from outside. Totally different problem in his mind, right? He's worried about gases and what's going on with air and so forth. And it leads him to study chemistry and the masses of elements. Dalton's view of solutions allowed him to accept Proust's idea of fixed proportions. Using something called the combining weights of the elements, which we'll discuss later, he produced the first table of atomic weights and developed his atomic theory, which had three points. Now, your book goes over these three points. And let's see. It is in chapter 15. Six, maybe? Sorry. Six or seven, something like that. We'll get to it. Now, what were his three points? So he comes up with this theory. By the way, this is a page from his text. These are his pictures of the elements, um, his symbols, I should say. And you can see the interesting thing he started to do here was put together compounds and molecules. So he's showing that the elements can be joined 
And uh, they're in simple ratios, which we'll get to. The first point of his theory, chemical elements are composed of very minute indivisible particles of matter called atoms, which preserve their individuality in all chemical changes. So the atoms are still there, in other words. When, when chemicals react, when elements react with other elements, the atoms are still there. They're still the same atoms. So chemical elements are composed of small indivisible particles called matter, I mean uh, atoms, and they preserve their individuality in all chemical changes. All atoms of the same element are identical in all respects, particularly in weight. Different elements have atoms differing in weight. Each element is characterized by the weight of its atom. Notice the focus on weight, which isn't surprising. That's what he was after, right? He was after weight, so he was fixated on that. When the only tool you have is a hammer, everything becomes a nail, right? Isn't that what they say? So he was fixated on weight, and we're, we're going to see as we move on in the history of chemistry that that ended up causing problems. It turns out the weight is not the most important characteristic of atoms in determining their, their properties. Right? He thought it was, and everybody thought it was until, um, well, we'll get to that. Chemical combination occurs by the union of the atoms of elements in simple numerical ratios. One atom of A to one atom of B. One atom of A to two atoms of B. Two atoms of A to one atom of B. Wow, this almost sounds like we're going to use the factor label method with this sort of thing at some point. And you can see here, he has a little basic scheme of all the different, he's trying to lay out all the possibilities, which of course aren't all the possibilities, but some of them. Two to one, one to one, one to three, and so on. And he's laying them out geometrically and stuff, but that's all just his convention. But pretty smart guy, nonetheless. So small whole number ratios, small whole number ratios, this was Dalton's unique contribution. Because if we look carefully at history points, what we'll find out is that not all of this was new. Point one, that everything's composed of indivisible little atoms, goes back at least to Democritus, if not further back. 450 BC, there was people talking about everything being composed of these tiny little hard particles. Democritus, it turns out, also hinted at aspects of point number two. What was point number two? Oh, wait. Right, they're, they're, they have different characteristics. You know, Democritus, I didn't get into this, but he actually talked about... Um, Democritus appears to have believed that different atoms had different shapes. Like, um, some atoms were pointy. And some atoms were round and smooth. And like, if they were round and smooth, they would taste sweet. And if they were pointy, they would taste sour. So see, Democritus was a true um, materialist. He didn't believe in, in anything that was kind of spooky. Like, he wouldn't like gravity at all, because gravity is this spooky action at a distance, they call it. He thought it had to have physical cause. If anything's going to affect something else, it has to be physically touching. So he's thinking, if it's sour, something's physically going on in my mouth. It must be the atoms are pointy. If it's sweet, they're nice and smooth and they're rolling across my tongue. So point number two, Democritus is already on to this kind of thing. Uh, but here's the, uh, and I mentioned already before, Boyle and Newton had also uh, believed in atoms. But Dalton's third point was truly novel in that it applied atomic theory to chemistry. Okay, this is where, this is where he made a link, right, between kind of the physics of atoms and chemical compounds. He was the first one to bring this in and start talking about, okay, what do atoms mean for us as chemists? How can we use it to understand matter more than just physics? And with Dalton's theory and his atomic masses, Man's mastery, mankind's mastery of matter took a great leap forward. It allowed chemists to see beyond the masses of elements in the laboratory 
to the atoms taking part in the reactions, and it provided a deeper understanding, and with it, a greater power to predict and control, as we will see. Now, one thing I want to bring out here, we're going to get to it more as we talk about electrons and protons. Nobody's ever seen an atom, okay? And you never will. They're too small. You can take pictures of them with fancy instruments, but they're not pictures made with light. They're pictures made with electrostatic forces and so forth. So they're kind of they're indirect pictures. They're made by a machine. And so you can't really see them. And we have to keep in mind that really what an atom is is it's a model of reality that we use to understand it. We think it's a pretty good model. So good that most people, probably you too, believe that atoms actually exist as little ground things. Right? But we should keep in mind that it is just a model. And I wouldn't be too surprised if somebody comes along one day and sweeps it away. Just like people swept away Aristotle's theory or something like that. That may sound crazy, but as you, when you look at the history of science and you see that happening again and again, you see old theories being superseded and whole worldviews changing, then it's, it's certainly not out of the realm of possibilities that that would happen. With the completion of Dalton's theory, chemistry entered a new phase. And the next revolution would not come until the early 1900s when people began to look inside the atom itself and learn that it was not indivisible at all. So you see there, there was a big change, you know. Maybe Dalton thought, wow, we have truly arrived. We figured out everything's made of these individual particles called atoms. They all have characteristic weights, and they combine simple small whole number ratios. We're done. But they weren't done because it turns out there's three parts to atoms. And then later on, it turns out, wait a minute, there's three parts to those parts. And wait a minute, OK? So I don't know if the process goes on and on for infinity or not, uh, infinitely or not. The bombs dropped in Japan were a frightful demonstration of the mastery of matter. Though they are perhaps no more amazing than some of the other modern developments made possible by chemistry, such as genetic engineering, which could have more, much more far-reaching impacts. If you have some free time, uh, sometime you guys aren't in my bio class, but look up this guy named Jack Horner on TED. If you ever go to TED.com, watch the little lectures, like 15-minute lectures. This guy wants to turn chickens into dinosaurs because he believes that there are latent dinosaur genes still residing in the DNA of chickens that can be turned on again. It's pretty amazing stuff that's going on in genetic uh, research. They're starting to think that there's no such thing as junk DNA. Some of the DNA that's not currently functioning may be ancestral DNA that is actually being switched off chemically in our cells. Which means should be able to switch it on again and switch off some of the other ones. Planet of the Apes, anyone? I don't know. So start acting strange, like, yeah, we'll know. You're right. You'll know if I come in one day, uh, jumping on the tables. From the dawn of civilization to the late 1700s, humankind's understanding grew slowly by baby steps and then it exploded. Following Lavoisier, am I pronouncing that right? Where's my French students out here? And Dalton, the world saw the rapid fire discovery of the elements that followed. So Dalton had about 20, 22 elements, I think, if that. But right after that, it just really started to like mushroom. The discovery of new inorganic and organic compounds the laws of electrolysis, catalysts that could be used to speed reactions, synthesis of organic chemicals like chloroform, aspirin, nylon, polyethylene, polyethylene terephthalate, which is the clear plastic that can withstand high pressures inside soda bottles, chemical fertilizers and pesticides, petroleum-based fuels, high-tech ceramics, an explosion of new medicines, light-emitting diodes, LEDs, nuclear energy, DNA splicing, and on and on and on. And that happened like 
really fast. So this is an interesting poster. It's, unfortunately, it's way too small uh, for you to see. But what it is is um, like this red, this orange part is world events. This is space and weather. The blue is medicine and disease. These are discoveries is what they are. They're just discoveries on a timeline. Chemistry is the light yellow. And uh, physics is the darker yellow. Periodic table is this intermediate yellow here. So this is chemistry and physics going like this. You can see how it's kind of narrow here and then it gets broader. But here's the main thing. If you look at the dates. This is 1000 BC. And right around here is 1700. So you can see that. And then after this, it goes in 50 year increments. So 1700, 1750, 1800. Then it goes actually in 20 year increments. If we move that way. So that shows you how, if this thing was put onto a linear scale, you'd see an enormous jump in the width of this band of yellow as we went that way. It was just like an explosion. Kind of like um, something happened in the 1700s that catalyzed science. Really. It really started back in, uh, we really want to take it back to the 1600s, probably. 15 and 1600s to Galileo, if you want to get the beginning. But then, it really didn't explode until the 1700s. The pink one is electric, electronics, electrics and electronics. Yeah. Yeah, right. There. So some interesting stuff, interesting trends. <clears throat> and that's it for now.